We are in the book of Exodus in chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28. We're going to do 28 and 29 this morning. <laughs> yes, we are. You're going to be here for four hours. <laughs> no, I really got through two chapters last, last service. We'll see. Why don't you stand up? Let's go through and read it together. Starting in chapter 28, start in verse 1. And it says, verse one, now take Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel that he may minister to me as priest, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him that he may minister to me as priest, verse four. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons that he may minister to me as priest. They shall take the gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and the fine linen and they shall make the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen artistically worked. It shall have two shoulder straps joined at its two edges, and so it shall be joined together. And the intricately woven band of the ephod, which is on it, shall be of the same workmanship, made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen. Then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone, six names on the other stone in order of their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in settings of gold, and you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as, a memorial, as memorial stones for the sons of Israel, so Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. You shall also make settings of gold, and you shall make two chains of pure gold, like braided cords, Fasten the braided chains to the settings. Verse 15, you shall make the breastplate of judgment artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen you shall make it. It shall be doubled into a square. A span shall be its length and a span shall be its width and you shall put settings of stones in it, four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and an emerald. This shall be the first row. The second row shall be a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one with its own name. They shall be according to the 12 tribes. Um, why don't you skip down with me to verse 30. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim. Oh, excuse me, I didn't want to go that far. Verse 28. They shall bind the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the ephod using a blue cord so that it is above the intricately woven band of the ephod and so that the breastplate does not come loose from the ephod. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. And let's stop right there and let's pray. Jesus, um, we just wanna again come before you and, and uh, Lord, you're good to us and um, you're a God who speaks to us from the very beginning, Lord. You've always known what was gonna take place and um, even the clothing on these guys is something that points forward to you. Um, Lord, we, we pray that as we're going through your word this morning that you just be speaking clearly to our hearts and uh, showing us um, who you are and showing us who we are uh, because of what you've done. And we just give you the time now and ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You have a seat. We've been, for those of you who haven't been here or who have missed, we've been going through the tabernacle. And uh, one of the things that I've been doing is just taking a little bit of time and um, pointing out all the types of Christ that you have in the tabernacle. A type of Christ is a, is a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. It's kind of a model through a story or a model through, um, you know, it's basically word pictures. So the most, you know, the, the easiest type of Christ that you can find in uh, the Old Testament are the sacrifices. They all represent Jesus. 
And so when Jesus went to the cross, he went to die for our sins. And that's exactly what was happening with sacrifices in the Old Testament. They were a symbol of my sin being put on an animal and then um, me being saved because of the offering of an innocent victim. That's the picture. And Jesus was an innocent victim. He's the only innocent man that's ever lived in the sense that he never did anything wrong. And then he died for you and he died for me. And so when you, when you go through the tabernacle, we've been, we've been talking about it and, it and it doesn't matter what you're looking at. It can be the, the curtains on the tabernacle. It can be the uh, engravings or, or the, uh, uh, the woven uh, uh, angels in the curtains. It can be the furniture. It doesn't matter what, what you look at. All of it points straight to Jesus. Gold is primary in it. Acacia is primary in it. Gold representing deity, acacia representing sinless humanity. Wood that doesn't rot is what acacia was. Um, silver is prominent, and silver is all about redemption. Uh, bronze is prominent. That's all about judgment. And uh, blue and purple and, and, and scarlet and all of that. Fine linen, white righteousness, uh, scarlet representing uh, blood and the death of Jesus. Blue is the one from heaven and so on. And so you have all these pictures um, throughout the uh, tabernacle that point forward to the coming of Jesus and what he was going to be and what he was going to do for us. These are uh, what, we, what we're going through and looking at right now are the high priest clothing. And then we're going to look at the high priest consecration in chapter 29. And again, Jesus is our great high priest. And so everything in this is going gonna, is gonna to point straight, straight forward, you know, straight to Jesus. And you know what? It's not arbitrary. It's, it's stuff that you have in the New Testament uh, where they point back to these things and say, this is a picture of Jesus. And so everything that we look at this morning is, you know, it's pretty cool. Um, we were read through quite a bit there. Um, one of the things that we looked at here um, when we read was a list. Look at verse four. It says, and these are the garments which they shall make a breastplate an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. How many are there? No, there's six. I tricked you. <laughs> the answer is usually seven. There's six right there. But there's one last um, artiment, uh, uh, article of, of uh, uh, adornment, basically, that the high priest put on. We didn't get to it. It's in verse uh, 36 through 38. It's a crown that goes on top of his head. And so six is the number of man, and when you add the crown, which is a crown of glory, um, you get seven, which is a number of completeness. So that's a cool thing. So let's go through, and real quick, I wanna go through and, and talk about the, the different parts that, that you have here. Breastplate, ephod, robe, coat, crown, belt or girdle, and then um, the plate on the, on the crown, or on the, uh, the plate that was on the crown, uh, which represents holiness to the Lord. This is a picture of what the high priest uh, might have looked like. And so that's, that's kind of cool. You see the, the two cherubim there and he's offering incense and uh, um, you see the, the uh, woven ephod and that whole thing. This is another picture. Um, and this was, uh, this was a costume that was basically put together by, uh, I believe it was, it's a group of Messianic Jews and they go through and um, uh, picture this whole thing pretty, pretty clearly. Um, one of the things that you have, um, uh, again with this whole thing, is this gold and blue and all of that stuff. Verse five, it talks about, um, they shall take the gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine linen, and they shall make the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen artistically worked. It shall have two shoulder straps joined at its uh, two edges, so it shall be joined together, and the intricately woven band of the ephod which is on it shall be of the same workmanship made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. And you shall take the two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of their names on one stone and six on the other. And so you have this ephod that, that's made, and the ephod is uh, basically an overgarment uh, type of thing uh, that, you, that you see on this guy. And again, you have the different articles in here. Now, all the way through the, the teaching on the tabernacle here um, in the curtains, you see blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. Blue representing the one from heaven again, and purple representing kingship. Um, scarlet, uh, remember the whole thing with the scarlet worm? You, you dried it and you crushed it to get the color. 
and then finally you have fine linen and that represents the blood of Jesus and fine linen represents Jesus' righteousness. But in the high priest garment, you have gold added in and it's because Jesus is our high priest and he's the God man. And so gold representing deity uh, becoming part of that whole thing. You look up on, if you look up on his shoulder, you see um, this strap that's, that's on top of his shoulder. And I can't remember if I, uh, I didn't do that. Let me go back here. Well, there's a strap on there and there's those two onyx stones that are on there. And those onyx stones, again, it talks about the fact that what they were doing with those was uh, taking and um, engraving the names of the children of Israel, eldest to youngest. And six on one side, six on the other side. Shoulder is the symbol of strength in scripture. And it's the idea of God, actually the high priest, who would be Jesus, carrying Israel on his shoulders. It's that, that kind of picture, which is a cool thing. Um, you, you have, again, the same, the same picture with us. Um, the word onyx literally means to shine with the luster of fire. And that's what God's going to make happen to you. Remember, those stones have Israel's name on it. And the Bible talks about the fact that when we uh, go home to be with the Lord, um, that we're gonna shine like the stars, you know, shine like the brightness of the stars forever. It says in Daniel chapter 12. Um, then you have this breastplate that's mentioned. And this is a picture of the breastplate. In verse 15, it says, you shall make the breastplate of judgment artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. Uh, you shall make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. You shall make it. Then look at verse 16. It shall be doubled into a square. A span shall be its length uh, and a span shall be its width. This is a span from here to here. So that's, that's how big the thing was. And Basically, what it was was a bag. They made a bag. And on the outside of the bag, they put the 12 stones that were there. And each one of those stones had one of the tribes of Israel's names written on it. And inside that bag, they had those two stones called the Urim and the Thummim. Now, the symbolism of, of that whole thing is pretty straightforward. Um, each one of the tribes of Israel being a gem to God. And the Bible talks about you being a gem to God. Also, and that's in the book of Zechariah. You can go, you can go look that one up. Um, actually, no, it's not Zechariah, it's Malachi. You can go look that one up. It's a really, really interesting passage. I'm not telling you where it's at either. It's just look through Malachi. <laughs> there are these two chains that are connected to it and they're connected to the, to the um, shoulder straps to hold it up. And then down again in verse 28, it talks about these two bindings of blue. And you can see those at the bottom of the breastplate and that's to hold it um, up against the heart of the high priest. And again, you have that picture of the people of God being on his heart, literally. It's that, that kind of picture as he goes in and ministers before the Lord. You know that Jesus intercedes for you. One of the cool things about being a Christian is, you know, people will pray for you, but have you ever asked somebody to pray for you and they didn't? You go, you know, one week you come in, you go, oh, I'm going through this hard stuff, man. Can you pray for me? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I'll pray for you. You come back the next week and you go, well, did you pray? And they're kind of like, oh, um, uh, uh. and you're like, oh, nobody prays for me. If nobody else prays for you, Jesus does. Yeah, he, he continually makes intercession, the Bible says. And when he goes in before the Father to make intercession for you, he has you on his heart with your name engraved, on a gem, that's the picture there. You're a gem with your name engraved on it. So that's a cool thing. And again, you see that he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually and he'll um, have the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart. Then you have this, th this whole thing with the Urim and the Thummim. And the word Urim uh, means lights and the word Thummim means perfections. And people will tell you that they know what they were and nobody knows what they were. So I'll just tell you that straight out. There's two stones. And these two stones were inside this bag that was the breastplate. And um, somehow they determined the will of God with those stones. And so some people had thought that maybe they were two differently colored stones, like maybe a white stone and a black stone. Not that, that those are the colors because we don't know what the colors were. Um, and that the high priest would ask God, uh, yes and no questions. God, do you want me to, I don't know, take, you know, whatever they want to come up. You want, you want us to go to war with these people? 
or, or something like that. And then he'd reach in and whichever stone he grabbed would determine whether or not that was God's will. So if it was a stone that indicated no, then they wouldn't do it. If it was a stone that indicated yes, then they would do it. And when the Bible talks about later on, you'll see these passages. Uh, uh, specifically, I'm thinking of some passages with David where he asked the high priest to come in with the ephod so that they can determine the will of God. This is what's being spoken about. They're coming in and, and the Urim and the Thummim is, is mentioned. You have it mentioned even after the return from Babylon. And so there were people that needed to be, you know, uh, basically uh, there, there were priests that they didn't know if they were um, really um, okay to be in the temple and they had to determine that with Urim and Thummim, it says. And so it's, these things were around for a long time. The problem with it being a yes, no answer is, is that when you read about David determining God's will with the ephod, it's not a yes or no answer. Um, basically, David says, should I go to war with these people? And the Lord says, yes, how should I go to war with them? And he gets a battle plan. And so you're not gonna get a battle plan by pulling out yes, no thing, you know, that, that kind of thing. It's just God just speaks to him and tells him what the battle plan is. And you see this over and over um, in the Old Testament. And I don't, again, I don't know how this was determined. Um, some people um, have thought that maybe the Urim and Thummim shone at certain points, and so you'd take them out, and if you were going to figure out who to anoint as priest or as king, like David, then it would shine on them, and that kind of stuff. But all of that's conjecture, we don't know. This is what we do know. If you wanna know the will of God, you had to go to the high priest, and the high priest would determine it with gems that were on his heart. And that's what he would do. And in the same way, if you wanna know the will of God for your life, you're gonna to have to go through your high priest. There's only one access to the Father. It's through the high priest, that's Jesus. So you wanna know the will of God for your life, you're gonna to have to go through Jesus. And then he determines that will. Um, verse 31, it says, you shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue. There shall be an opening for his head in the midst of it. Um, it shall have a woven binding all around its um, opening like the opening in a coat of mail so that it does not tear. Verse 33, and upon its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet all around its hem and the bells of gold between them all around a gold bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe all around. And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers and its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out that he may not die. And so here's a picture of this same guy and you can see at the bottom of the ephod there, you can see the, the bells and then the woven pomegranates woven out of thread, um, all these different colored threads. And again, those represent Jesus. Um, the bells specifically had a practical purpose. Um, when um, Aaron went into the Holy of Holies, you could hear him walking around because the bells would tinkle. And so basically Aaron would go inside to be offering uh, sacrifices and stuff like that. You can imagine his son sitting outside in the holy place, you know, kind of the foyer to go into the Holy of Holies where the, um, where the uh, lampstand and all that stuff was. And they would hear this tinkle, tinkle, tinkle. Hear Aaron tinkling inside the most holy place. Tinkle, tinkle, tinkle. If they ever heard tinkle, 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 thump. And didn't hear anything else. Then they're like, oh no, <laughs> he's dead. And that's specifically what he says, uh, what the Lord says it's for. That he can go into the holy place before the Lord and when he comes, um, and when he comes out that he may not die. And so, you know, basically it was for that. And so that's most likely where they got the idea of uh, tying a, ro or a, a rope around his ankle and uh, pulling the high priest out if, if he ever stopped ringing the bells, tinkling in there. And so they just pull him out. And I've never found that. I don't know any, I've never found a place where it says that they tied a rope around his leg and that kind of thing. But I might do that <laughs> if I didn't want to go out there and drag him out if he died. There's no reference to anybody dying either. What's with the pomegranates? And pomegranates, according to the Jews, were the fruit that was on the, on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. And so from, from our um, uh, tradition, it's an apple. You always hear about the apple that's uh, you know, on, the, on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That didn't come from the Bible. Uh, f um, biblically speaking, pomegranates are mentioned. They aren't mentioned as being the fruit, but the Jews believed it to be the fruit. And once I found that out, I was like, absolutely, yes, I think it was a pomegranate. That's a very cool thing. Have you ever tried to eat a pomegranate? Yeah, and not without a knife. 
So you just pick a pomegranate off a tree and you're not gonna bite into it. You know, well, you could bite into it, but it's, you know, it's got this big old thick peel on it and stuff. And if you're gonna eat a pomegranate, you're working at it. That's what you're doing. And I just think that's God. You know, it's a, it's a kind of idea that he puts a, he puts a fruit up there that you're gonna have to work at to get into. It's not kind of the thing where you're kind of got in your hand, you're kind of like, well, should I bite it, shouldn't I? You know, <laughs> if you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it. And you're into it and you can't say, oh, you know, I just kind of put my mouth up to it. It just, it was so luscious that my, you know, I don't know, I don't know. You're not gonna be able to say that. God's gonna look at you and go, yeah, right. I designed that to be hard to get to and you went after it. That's, so, so where'd the apple thing came from? You know where the apple thing uh, most likely came from? Christmas trees. Um, you know, Christmas trees are not biblical, but they are thoroughly Christian. And where they come from, they don't come from pagan stuff. You read this stuff on the internet all the time. There is no reference to a Babylonian or a Roman or an Egyptian or any pagan cutting down a tree, trimming it out with bulbs and all of that kind of stuff. No reference anywhere at all. Um, where it comes from is Paradise Place in the Middle Ages. And um, what, they, what the Christians used to do is they would, in the middle of the winter, have these reenactments of the fall of man. And if they were gonna do the reenactments, what they had to do was they had to have two trees. And one was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the other one, it's not just the tree of knowledge. Everybody says that, they don't know what they're talking about. God wasn't trying to keep knowledge from people. He was trying to keep knowledge of evil from people. They already had the knowledge of good. And so you had to have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you had to have the tree of life. And um, you're in the middle of winter in Europe and everything's dead except for fir trees. And so those are the trees that they used in these paradise plays. And then you had to have a fruit that, got on, that was put on it. And the fruit, you know, obviously you're gonna, you're gonna trim it with fruit and that kind of stuff because it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve's got to eat the fruit. And so the last fruit picked in the fall, guess what it was? Apples, and you could store apples and they, they would remain good for a period of time. And that's what they used in the paradise place. That's most likely where we got ornaments for the trees too. And so when you're, when you're looking at Christmas trees, again, they're not biblical. You don't have Christmas trees in the Bible, but they are Christian. And so, um, you know, uh, um, I have thoroughly um, researched that. Um, and the reason was, because I used to be an anti-Christmas tree person. I was one of those people that went, oh, Christmas trees are pagan. And I got it from a book. And then I found out that the book, uh, the guy didn't have his research straight. It was called The Two Babylons by um, Hislop. And it was a bummer, because I really liked the book. I thought it was cool. But he didn't have his research straight. And then I went back and I started looking into those things. And I found out none of the things that he said about Christmas trees and all that kind of stuff was true. It's just not, it's just not there until you get to the, uh, again, to the Middle Ages. So before I knew this stuff, I used to pick on my wife because she always wanted a Christmas tree. And I, you know, when I, when I read the book, I stopped doing Christmas trees because it's pagan. And um, then, you know, you know, I get married, my wife wants Christmas trees and she's like, can I have one? And I'm like, oh, come on. And so, but I let her do it. And um, every time she would put it up, I'd go, oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, we all bow down and worship thee. We worship the old Christmas, you know, just make fun. And, and she'd always throw things at me. We'd had a, we had a really good time. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, then, then I found out I was wrong and I had to tell her. That was not a good day. <laughs> In any case, you, know, you have that. The next chapter, oh, let's go, let's go through and read the rest of it. You shall uh, put on a blue, uh, or verse 36, um, you shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet and you shall put it on a blue cord that it may be on the turban. It shall be on the front of the turban so it shall be on Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of uh, Israel hallow in all their holy gifts and it shall always be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. And the engraving was holiness to the Lord as it says in that passage. And you know what? We're priests too. And when we come in before God, one of the things that should be written across our foreheads is holiness to the Lord. I don't mean literally. It, it, it's the idea of I'm, I'm a guy who's set apart for Jesus. I'm following him and I want my life to be something that honors him. 
And again, that was a picture there. Priest's coat, you shall uh, skillfully weave the tunic of fine linen thread. You shall make the turban of fine linen. You shall make the sash of woven work. For Aaron's sons, you shall make tunics, you know, make sashes for them, and you shall make hats for them for glory and for beauty. So you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, on his sons with him. You shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them that they may minister to me as priests. And you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They shall reach from the waist to the thighs. They shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they come into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place that they do not incur iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever to him and his descendants after him. And that was their underwear. So these guys had to wear underwear. You didn't, you didn't get to wear nothing underneath your robes. And we could get in all into that, but pagan um, worship was highly illicit as far as sexually goes. And God wanted none of it. That's, uh, that, that whole idea, that region of the body uh, is, uh, is something that's supposed to be honoring to God. And uh, that's, that's what God's talking about. It's made out of linen, it's righteousness, that kind of thing. There's one place for sex and that's in the marriage relationship and no place else. Chapter 29 is the consecration of the priests. It says, and this is what you shall do to them to hallow them for ministering to me as priests. Um, Take one young bull, two rams without blemish and uh, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. You know that oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. You shall make them of wheat flour. And so these unleavened cakes were made out of wheat flour. And when you get to the New Testament, Jesus specifically identifies himself as a kernel of wheat. He says, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it bears no fruit. But if it does, it, uh, um, it basically says it bears lots of fruit. And guess what? You're the fruit that came from the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Um, wheat, uh, wheat flour is made by crushing wheat. And that's what happened with Jesus to uh, to get the, to become the unleavened bread of God that you have in this Old Testament passage. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket with the bull and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons, you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and you shall wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments, put the tunic on Aaron and the robe of the ephod, um, the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the intricately woven band of the ephod. You shall put the turban on his head put the holy crown on the turban and you shall take the anointing oil, pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and, his, uh, and put tunics on them and you shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons and put the hats on them. The priesthood shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. Um, so you shall consecrate Aaron and his sons. Talking about clothing these guys. Now let me stop right here and just go back and talk about the things that happen with Aaron and his sons. When God consecrates these guys through Moses, um, how many um, acts do you think that Moses performs with them? How many? Seven. Yeah, it's seven, once again. And the first one is in chapter 28, verse one. Let's go back there and look at this real quick. It says, 28.1, now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And this is how that looks. There's a whole, there's millions of people there. And Moses is to take these guys out of those millions of people and set them apart and, and consecrate them as priests to God, take them up from among those people. Um, that's a picture of God choosing us. These guys are chosen out of a huge crowd. And it's exactly the same picture that we have in the New Testament of God choosing us. When you, when you go through and look at the Bible, the, the choice of God, a lot of times people have this, these, this huge argument over um, free will versus election and that kind of thing. And this is talking about election. And election is clearly taught in scripture. And this is the way that election works. God looks down through the ages, and I'm just paraphrasing verses here. I'm referring to verses. He looks down through the ages and he sees you. And he sets his heart upon you, sets his love upon you for no reason other than that he loves you. And it's really clear in scripture. God makes it abundantly clear that he didn't do it because of what you were going to do or who you were going to be. He just sets his love on you just because he does. And that's the election of God. That's how it's taught in scripture. Now, 
one of one of the things that um, again is is really cool about that is is the fact that you know just being chosen is cool. Remember when you're a kid. Whenever I think of this, I think about me in junior high school. When I was in junior high school, I was a little monkey. And, uh, you know, I, um, I was small, and, um, you know, I was like 100 and, um, 103 pounds my freshman year. And I had grown between eighth grade and my freshman year. And so I was, a, I was a little guy. And so when they went to, you know, we'd, we'd play sports or whatever um, in PE, and they'd go to choose up teams. Guess who always got chose last? Yeah, it was always me. And it was because the coach said, you got to choose everybody. It's the only reason I got picked. You know, you got you to choose everybody. And I was always last, unless there's a guy in a wheelchair. And then, you know, I'm second to last. You know, that, that kind of thing. And um, it, it was like that that whole time. When I got into high school, and it was always a bummer. Because, I, you know, we'd go up to choose teams. And I was, I'd be like, they're just going to choose me because I have to be on the team. And the coach is going to make them. And it was always humiliating. And until I got into high school, when I got into high school, I started growing and I got, I got bigger and uh, I was involved in sports and I got better. And I still remember to this day, the first time that I got chosen first, it was an awesome day. You know, the coach picked out two, uh, two captains and said, okay, choose up teams. And the guy, guy looked at the, the whole group of people and he looked at me and he goes, I want wintery. And I don't know what we were doing. We were probably playing, playing football or soccer or something like that. And, you know, if we were playing soccer, we played it like football, so it didn't matter. You know, it's like, we didn't know what we were doing. But uh, he picked me and I was like, are you kidding me? I just got picked first. And I didn't let anybody know that. You know, I just kept it cool, got chosen. Like I've always been chosen first or something. You know, I went up, but I was really excited that time. And then the next, the next thing that I remember really well is uh, when uh, the coach uh, let us all choose captains for the teams, and I got chosen as captain for the team. And I was like, oh, you know, and it's cool to be chosen. It's cool to be picked. It's cool for somebody to look at you and value you and want you on their team. And I'm telling you, that's exactly what God did with you. He chose you. Down through the ages, he looked at you, and he goes, I want you. You come with me. The next thing you see is that in uh, verse four, it says to Moses, and Aaron and his sons, you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So Aaron gets chosen. Does he, at the point he gets chosen, just walk over to where he's supposed to be going? Nope. But what Moses does, he's a representative of God. And in this case, he's a picture of Jesus. And what Moses does is he brings him over to the tabernacle of meeting. And in the same way, um, the Bible talks about the fact that we're brought. There's a passage in 1 Peter 3.18 that says this, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the spirit. And that verse right there says, Jesus literally brings us to God. That's what he does. Third thing that you see in the passage is in verse four, it says he's washed. It says, you're gonna bring them to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and you shall wash them with water. Does washing and water have anything to do with the New Testament and you and me? Yeah, absolutely. And so the Bible talks about the fact that we're not holy in and of ourselves, we've been washed. And it's a picture of regeneration. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And so we're washed too. And then verses five through nine is all about Moses putting the clothes on Aaron and his sons. So literally what, what you got here is Moses came up and he picked out Aaron and his sons. And then he said, come with me. He brought them to the door of the tabernacle. He washes them. And then he st starts taking these articles of clothing and he's the one who puts the clothing on these guys. And they're just kind of standing there while all, the, all this stuff is done to them. What's the putting on of the clothing represent? And what that represents is putting on Christ. You have these passages all through the New Testament that talks about put off the old man, put on the new man, uh, put, off the, put off the world, put on Christ, um, uh, put off lying, put on telling, you know, put on telling the truth. It's, it, it's that kind of picture. And literally in Greek, when you read the phrasing there, it's unclothe yourself of unrighteousness and put on, clothe yourself 
with Jesus. Close your, clothe yourself with a new life. Clothe yourself, you know, it's, it's that kind of deal. And it's exactly what's happening to Aaron right here in this passage. And again, in the same way, um, I'm supposed to put off what I used to be and start putting on Jesus. And Jesus is active in that whole thing. The next thing, thing that you see is in verse 21. Go down to verse 21 there. It says, you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar. They've sacrificed a ram here by this point. You shall take some of the blood that's on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments, on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him. He and his garments shall be hallowed and his sons and his garments with him. And this is the anointing of Aaron. Um, anointing is a representation of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so when we become believers, one of the things that God provided for us to give us power to live the life that he calls us to is the anointing of the Holy Spirit or the gift of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus told the apostles who'd been with him for three and a half years, do not do any ministry until you've been given the gift that was promised to you. And he was talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that's in Acts chapter one, verse eight. And so in the same way, God anoints us and will give us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in the next section here, um, if you look down in verse uh, 22, you shall take the fat of the ram, fat tail, fat that covers the entrails, fatty lobe attached to the liver, two kidneys and the fat on them, right thigh for it is a ram of consecration, one loaf of bread, one cake made with oil, one wafer from the basket of the unleavened bread that is before the Lord. And you shall put all these in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons, and you shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. You shall receive them back from their hands and burn them on the altar as a burnt offering, as a sweet aroma before the Lord. It's an offering made by fire to the Lord. And so in this section, their hands are filled. And again, what Moses does is he brings these different items that are to be sacrificed and place them in the hands of Aaron. And then he's holding the hands of Aaron apparently, and he's moving his hands, it's a wave offering. So he's moving his hands like this, and then he takes it back, and Moses is the one who does the sacrificing at that point. And again, Aaron's standing there while all this stuff is going on. Um, you have a passage that kind of goes along with this. His hands are filled is the, is the point that I'm making here. Turn to um, John chapter one, or first John, excuse me. First John chapter one, verse one. I wanna show you something. This is obviously written by John, the apostle John. And this is what he says, that which was from the beginning, verse one, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. And life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. You know, when you, when you look at this, actually this is, you know, I, every verse that I'm teaching through is always my favorite verse in the Bible. I know I say that a lot, but this is one of those that's really impacted me over the years because you have this whole testimony from John. Look at verse one again, that which was from the beginning. That's the word arche in Greek. It's the idea of the vanishing point. It's not the beginning of the gospel or the beginning of the story of the gospel or the beginning of Jesus's life. It's from the beginning from the beginning of all, of everything that there ever was, and even before that point. And again, literally, it's, the, it's from the vanishing point that he's speaking about here. And it's the idea that Jesus is timeless. He's someone who came out from this eternity and stepped into time. He was the one who was from the beginning. And then he says, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes. Now, he's talking about hearing Jesus speak here, hearing the words of Jesus. And you guys have heard the words of Jesus. I, I share the words of Jesus with you all the time. And so you come to church here on a Sunday and you'll hear the words of Jesus, but not from Jesus. You hear it from me. And so it's my voice giving you the words of Jesus. Or maybe you've heard it from your mom, or maybe you've heard it from the radio. 
I have this, this uh, app on my phone that plays the Bible out loud. And, you know, I, I, I have it on my phone, you know, when I'm going on long drives and sometimes even when I'm coming to work, I'll just be, I'll just be listening to the word of God. And so I'll hear the words of Jesus. And it's always by somebody who speaks really well in an English accent, you know. And uh, so I'll hear that. What John's talking about is the, what he heard from Jesus himself. When John talks about the, the things which we have heard, he's thinking of the voice of Jesus. Can you imagine you know, every time you pick up your Bible and you go through and read the words of Jesus, you just hear his voice ringing in your ears your whole life. And it was something that was handed to John, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon. And that's the idea. He, he says it twice. And the reason he's doing it is for emphasis. He's, he's talking about we've seen him with our eyes. And that would be more of a casual seeing in the sense of, yeah, we, we all saw him. And when they first started dealing with Jesus, that's how they looked at him. But the more that they knew him, the more that they saw the things that he did, the more that they in, um, intimately examined him, took real good long looks at him. And you can again imagine that. You start out with Jesus and you think he's just a teacher and then he starts healing people and, and turning, uh, you know, uh, turning water into wine and m multiplying bread and loaves and, or uh, bread and fish and that whole thing. And I imagine if I was one of those guys that every once in a while when he wasn't looking, I would be staring, going, who in the world am I dealing with? One time that, would, that I would absolutely be staring at him is when he was doing the, the feeding of the 5,000, breaking bread and breaking fish and coming up with more bread and more fish. And when that whole thing starts, he just takes a kid's lunch and starts breaking it, putting it in a basket, you know, doing this kind of stuff, but the basket starts filling up. And as the basket's filling up, you know, I, I would look at that first and just go, okay, whatever, you know, he's, he's doing that. What's he doing? I don't know. But then I'd start watching and he's, he's asking me to come up and get a basket of food that I'm going to pass out and it's going to end up being 5,000 men that get fed. Well, you can be sure that when I walked up to him that I'm looking at his hands going, how in the world is he doing this? That's an act of creation was what Jesus was doing there. And it's another indication of who he was. It goes on and says, which we've looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. And so there would be times when they touched him, when they hugged him, you know, when he touched them, that kind of stuff. And that would hang with you for the rest of your life. It was stuff that was given to John. It was stuff that was given to Peter. His hands were filled. Hands were a picture of work. And what was supposed to happen with these things, they're given to us too. Not straightforward personally in the same sense that they got to have it, but they're given to us too. And what the high priest did was he took it and he waved it. He presented these things. And what he's presenting is a sacrifice. And that's exactly what you're supposed to be doing. It's exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. We have a sacrifice that was made for us and we're supposed to be presenting it, showing people who it is, what, what it is that Jesus has done for us. And so that's a cool thing. And then it was again offered to the Lord. Back over in Exodus 29. Let's move on here. The next thing that you see is that they're sanctified. You see that in 29, 44, down in verse 44. It says, so I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. And again, that's, that's, the, that's the idea of being set apart for God's use. It's the idea of being sanctified for God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 13, that we're not to present our members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present ourselves to God as being alive from the dead and our members as instruments of righteousness to God. And that's the idea, you know, what's that mean? That's the idea of I've got members, thumb, fingers, hand, arm, ears, eyes. I've got members of my body, parts of my body. And they're to be presented to God as instruments of righteousness and not presented to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. And it's the, the idea that not only is my mouth, the things that I say supposed to be given over to God, but literally my whole body is supposed to be given over to God. And you know what, you guys, most of the times when you guys are in a situation where you're doing something that's dishonoring to God or just flat out sin, 
Um, you are presenting your members. For example, your feet are designed to um, honor God. And so the places that you go should be honoring to God. And if you're in the wrong place, you got yourself there and what you did with your feet was use them as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. And it's the same thing with your hands. It's the same thing with your eyes. It's the same thing with your ears. It's the same thing with your tongue. You're either offering those things to God and God is using those things or you're messing around with stuff that you're not supposed to be doing. And so again, you have that. And again, when you look at this passage, Moses did it all for him. He chose them, he brought them. It was by his, his hands that they were washed, that they were clothed, that they were anointed. Moses is the one who sacrificed. Moses is the one, we'll read about it in a minute, who anointed these guys with blood. Moses is the one who filled their hands and received back to give to God. Moses is the one who did all of that stuff. And it's a picture of the work of Christ and our salvation, okay? Then there are four exceptions to this whole thing. There are four things that Aaron and his sons did. And the first one is that they put their hands on the head of the bull. If you look back up in verse 10, it says, you shall also have the bull brought before the tabernacle of meeting and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the bull. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. You shall take some of the blood of the bull, put it on the horns of the altar with your finger, pour all the blood beside the base of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails, the fatty lobe attached to the liver, two kidneys, fat that's on them, burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull, with its skin and its offal, you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. So the first offering is a sin offering. When they put their hands on top of it, it was a representation that my sin was going from me to an innocent victim and that that victim was going to be slaughtered. You'll notice that the, that the um, animal was burned outside the camp. Okay, so they took the insides, they offered on the altar, the outside, the whole animal was burned outside the camp. Where did Jesus suffer and die? Yeah, outside the city of Jerusalem. And um, burning is always a representation of judgment. So Jesus was judged outside the camp. And that's specifically mentioned in the book of Hebrews. And so you have that whole thing. That's a picture of confession. My part in this whole thing is to first come to, to the Lord and confess if I will confess my sin, he's faithful and just, and he'll forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So that's Aaron's first part, was confession. The second part was he put, him on, put his hands on the ram's head. Look at verse 15. You shall also take one ram. Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram, and you shall take its blood and sprinkle it all around on the altar. Then you shall cut the ram in pieces, wash its entrails and its legs, and put them with its pieces and with its head. And you shall burn the whole ram on the altar. It's a burnt offering to the Lord. It's a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. And so this is a whole burnt offering. And you read about these in the Old Testament. And it was something that you did after a sin offering. If you wanted to come before God, you had to offer a sin offering first, but then you could bring an offering to God that represented your, your, you giving your whole life to him. And that's what this represents. Holy given and holy acceptable, um, holy accepted. It's on the altar. It's something that was acceptable to God after the sin offering was made. And the Bible again talks about the fact that we've been made accepted to God. There's a passage in Ephesians 1, 5, and 6. It says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, that's that whole taken thing, that whole chosen thing, according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. I made accept, the beloved there is Jesus. I made accepted in Jesus. And so this is where I stand. I come before God, I confess my sin and I'm forgiven. And then I offer a whole burnt offering. And it's the idea of I'm offering everything that I've got. And what God wants from you is everything. He doesn't want half of you. He doesn't want a quarter of you. He doesn't want your time split up. He wants everything. And so I offer myself to the Lord. And what he does is he accepts it. He accepts me. So now I'm forgiven and I'm accepted. And then the third thing that you see is, is he puts his hands on the ram of consecration. 
And if you look down in verse 19, it says, you shall also take the other ram and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the ram. Then you'll kill the ram, take some of its blood, put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron, on the tip of the right ear of his sons, on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar. And you shall take some of the blood that's on the altar and some of the anointing oil, sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments and so on. And um, they did that. You put your hands on the, on the hands of the, of the ram of consecration. If you look down in verse, at the end of verse 22, it says, um, and the right thigh, for it is a ram of consecration. And that, again, that's that whole idea of being set apart for God. So there is the part where God sets you apart. And that's what we went through first, where he goes, I want you, I've chosen you, I want you in my family. And then he sets you apart as special. And then there's the part where you set yourself apart. And God comes along and goes, you know, it's, it, it's again that, that whole process. You know, I put my hand on the head of that, of the ram of consecration. And what I'm saying is I'm in, I'm in. This is what I want for my life. And so I wanna be set apart for God's use here. And again, that's what he does. They take the blood and they put it on the tip of their ear. That's down here. And it's the idea of the things that I hear not the, not the, well, let me put it, to, put it to you this way. The things that I listen to, because I hear all kinds of stuff, but the things that I listen to are things that are gonna honor God. That's what consecration is. You know what, I, I, I've got all kinds of books. I read philosophy. I read all, I read all kinds of authors. And I don't, uh, you know, many times I don't really care where they come from as long as they're old authors. The new ones I don't spend much time on. But I, I read all of this stuff and I hear a lot of things, there are only certain things that I listen to. And there are things that are honoring to God. I'm not interested in what the world has to say about my life. I'm not interested in what the world says about how I get to heaven or how I don't get to heaven or whether or not there's a heaven or all, all that nonsense. They don't know what they're talking about. I came from there. They were lost when I was there and they're still lost. What I, what I listen to is the things that um, honor God. And so your ears, your hands, Again, that's an instrument of works, the things that you do. And so the works that I do need to honor God. And then the feet, the places that you go. And so wherever I'm going, it needs to honor God. And it doesn't matter where I go. I could go to Disneyland, I could go to a bar, I could go to a birthday party, I could go to church, I could go to wherever, it needs to honor God. I'm not saying bar because you can go out and hang out at a bar someplace and that's honoring to God. If I was going into a bar, I'd have a purpose and the purpose would be the people that are in there that need to know Jesus, right? If you're in a bar for any other reason, you got some problems. But in any case, when I'm, when I'm doing the things that I'm doing, going in the places that I'm going, it needs to be honoring to God. And then fourthly, you, um, oh, I forgot the verse. For by one offering he's forever, um, uh, perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And then the fourth thing is they ate the ram. They ate the bread. And if you go down to um, verse 27, from the ram of consecration, you, you, you shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering, which, he's, which is waved, thigh of the heave offering, which is raised, of that which is for Aaron and of that which is for his sons. It shall be from the children of Israel, for Aaron and his sons by statute forever, for it's a heave offering. It shall be a heave offering from the children of Israel from the sacrifices of their peace offerings, that is their heave offering to the Lord. And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed in them and to be consecrated in them. The son, that son who becomes priest in his place shall put them on for seven days when he enters the tabernacle of meeting to minister in the holy place. Verse 31, and you shall take the ram of the consecration, this ram that they've just been talking about, and boil its flesh in the holy place. Then Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. They shall eat those things with which the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them, but an outsider shall not eat them because they are holy. And so you have Aaron eating from this ram of consecration. The ram again represents Jesus. Is there any passage in the New Testament that talks about the fact that we're supposed to eat from Jesus? Yeah. 
And so in the New Testament, Jesus is talking, John 6, 35, and he said to them, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. In 6, 53, same passage, it says, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And then in uh, verses 57 and 58, it says, as a living father sent me and I live because of the father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. And it's talking about partaking of Jesus. It's the idea of taking him inside. And when you eat something, it literally becomes a part of you. That's the idea. And in the same way, you have two different representations there. There was, there was the, the flesh of the ram and you had the bread in, the, in those two areas. Jesus being the bread of life and Jesus being our sacrifice. And in those two areas, they eat from it and it begun, again becomes a part of them. And when you become a Christian, what's supposed to happen is you are actually supposed to have Christ come and live inside of you and literally become a part of you. Confession is, the, is uh, again the first step um, uh, and a full offering of yourself to the Lord is a second step. A life that's set apart for his use is a third step. And partaking of Jesus is the fourth step. And those are the things that we're supposed to be doing as believers. Again, New Testament, you're a priest. Old Testament, this is what the priest did. And again, it's a picture of what we have in Christ. There, two chapters, done. <laughs> Let's all stand. I'll pray for you. And God, again, uh, we just come before you, Lord, and we thank you so much for the, the fact that you're, you're a God of prophecy. You're a God who's, who speaks forth the um, end from the beginning. And Lord, we've just gone through and, and seen that every detail of what happened with these guys in their anointing and in their clothing and in the ministry that they had, even the parts of the animals that they were eating were things that pointed to your work and uh, um, to the gospel, Lord. And uh, God, we, we thank you that we, we serve a God who is into such intricate detail. Knowing that, Lord, we know how um, intricate your knowledge is of us and the things that we go through in our life, the ways that we think, uh, the ways that we honor you, you see it all. The ways that we dishonor you, you see that too. And Lord, we just want our lives to be consecrated to you. That whole idea of being set apart for your use, just special for you. And God, I just, I just pray for these people that you'd have your hands on them, that you'd anoint each one with your Holy Spirit, that they would have the power to live the life that you've called them to and to be the representative um, that you've called them to be, that on their foreheads would be holiness for the Lord um, and that people, people would see it in just a real practical way. Pray that you go before them now and that you bless them and ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen.